Hello, my name is Renee, and I want to welcome you to Kingdom Harvest Church, where we are advancing the kingdom through God-given authority. We are about to start our worship service, but before we do, I want to invite you to check in by texting the word CHECK to 678-771-3267. This way we know who's watching, who we are to pray for this week, and how we can stay connected. Secondly, if you're looking for a place to connect, well, look no further. Kingdom Harvest Church is a great place to belong. Just text the word CONNECT to 678-771-3267. Fill in the info and someone on our small group growth team will get in touch with you promptly. Finally, if today's message is a blessing to you, and I know it will be, please partner with us in financial support with our ministry. You can do this by texting the word GIVE to 678-771-3267. And of course, all of this information is on our church website at kingdomharvest.org. Now let's get ready for the word. God has given Bishop Stringfield a word that will transform and revolutionize your life forever. I might have a new hairdo next Sunday. God, God is shifting some things in my life. He's transforming some things in my life. Some things are turning around in my favor. I know you've been struggling. I know it's been hard. I know it's been difficult. But I've come to announce to you that things are getting ready to change in your favor. I, I want to announce to you that it's been a long time coming. And for some of you, God is getting ready to make up the time that you put in. That you thought that it was lost and was gone. You, you, you thought that the years were took control and, and you had no chance to get back. I want to announce to you that God is bringing it around again in your favor. He's restoring some of your years that you lost messing with folk that wasn't attached to where you were going. He's restoring the years that the canker worm and the pomegranate, Lord help me in here took away from you. Look at somebody said, God getting ready to make it up to you. Tell them you ain't missed nothing. You ain't missed nothing. Come on, tell them again. You ain't missed nothing. He's getting ready to turn things around in your favor. I need you to climb up on faith and understand what God is trying to take us. I, I need you to understand what God, and I know you don't see it, and I know it's difficult uh, walking with God to a place that you don't actually understand or see. He tells Abraham, get from your folk. Get from the folk that's going to influence you about where you've been and about where you are. And I need you to go to a place where God is showing you. Now, God taking Abraham in a place that he'd never been before. Listen, it's it's okay. to You can be in the perfect will of God and not really know where you're going. God is taking us somewhere. Look at somebody say, God is taking us somewhere. I need you to understand that God is getting ready to shift some things in this house, in this ministry, in your life, in your job, on your, in your home. He's getting ready to shift things in your favor. I just need you to believe it. Look at somebody say, I believe. I believe. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have not done so, take out your phones and text the word check to 678-771-3267. Just check in. We want to know who's watching. We want to know who we need to be praying for and interceding for. We want to make sure we're connected to that. We want to connect to where you are. Amen. And we want you to know that, listen, somebody is praying for you. Somebody is praying for you. And everything is going to be all right. The word of the Lord says that all things are working together for your good. I need you to understand that. I need you to grab a hold of your life and understand that nothing happens to you by chance. God is shifting things in your favor. Amen. All right. Let's get to the word of the Lord. Lord, I'll be walking on chairs in a minute if I need to calm down a little bit here. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. All right. Well, today we're going to finish up our series that we've been talking about uh, for the last five weeks. And... Uh, the series is entitled, The New You. Look at somebody said, The New You. Old saints used to say, be, please be patient with me because God is not through with me yet. Because the new you, by definition, is the you that God intended you to be. 
It is that you that God created in you. It is that you that God desires for you to be. And, and this series, we've looked at certain aspects of the new you that God intended for you to be. First, we looked at the you spiritually. That is the basis by which everything else has to flow. That's the foundation. You can have a beautiful home. You can have a beautiful, you know, beautiful structure. But if the foundation is not good, it's not going to last. And so many times we build our walk with God on sand. We build it on bad foundation. And, and when we try to put more weight on your life and more on you, the foundation can't hold it. You know, because sometimes we base the foundation of our walk on our gifts. But I tell people all the time, don't let your gift take you where your character can't keep you. See, see, the spirituality of you is about who you are really. The spiritual you is about what you really believe about yourself. It's not the Sunday morning you. It's the, it's the Saturday night you. It's the Friday night you. It is the you that, that uh, who you really are and what you really intrinsically believe about yourself. We talked about the new you spiritually. We talked about the new you relationally. Amen. Because if you're not relationally healthy, you're not healthy. We talked about the emotional new you. And if you're not emotionally healthy, you're not healthy at all. When you're emotionally drained and when you're emotionally hurting and broken, you cannot be the you that God intended to, for you to be. So, you know, you got to get the you got to get the series on the website to catch up because y'all behind. I also talked about the new you physically, right? The new you physically that the temple. Jesus, says, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? That taking care of your body is just as important as you know any other aspect of who you are, because you can be spiritually deep. You can know revelations, you know, that men and angels don't understand. You can you can be you can be word is stooped, but but if you're sick. And if you're, 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 you know, you can't breathe and you can't run and you can't talk, all of that stuff is just going to stay in you. you. You need to be physically there too. Amen. So I'm not telling you, you know, to jump on a treadmill tomorrow. I'm just, it's important. Last week we started talking about uh, the financial you. And we gave you some spiritual principles um, as a matter of fact, we gave um, four, four dimensions of what God intended for your life financially. We gave you the spiritual aspect of you financially. And, and we discovered that, you know, let's put it in steps or stairs or a, a ladder, if you will. And, and it was the initial giver. We talked about the um, systematic giver or the regular giver. They, they give based upon... You know, the system that they create, I'm going to talk about more, more about that today. And, and then the proportional giver or, or the, the tithing giver who gives out of obedience. And then the sacrificial giver who gives generous or, or a generous giver. And I told you that anybody who's generous, anybody who, who, is, um, who has a heart of generosity will always have. They will always have. Amen. All right. So let's let's jump in right in because I got a long way to go in a short time to get there. And I know y'all tune out after about 25 minutes. So let, let's jump right into the text today. Father, we thank you for the privilege of sharing in your word today. Lord, we thank you for where you brought us from. We thank you for where you have positioned us right now. And Lord, we praise you in advance for where you are going to take us. Your word declares that eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor has it entered the hearts of man. The thing that you have prepared for us. So Father, we ask this Sunday morning that you would just breathe on your word today and breathe on your people. Breathe on your servant. I borrow the words of David and I make them my own today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. As you did in Isaiah's day, take a call off of the altar and place it upon our lips that the words we speak be not our own, but be yours. Holy Ghost, have your way and say whatever you need to say and do whatever you need to do. And we will be so careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to walk out the practical side of what we discovered spiritually last week. Now, I, I need to warn you that, you know, you might have to say ouch a couple of times. But you're going to be all right. My mom used to give us that that stuff in that, ye that yellow bottle called 666. And that's the nastiest stuff in the world. I'd rather eat guacamole. Now, I like guacamole now. But it was... It tastes bad, but it was good for us. Amen. So sometimes what's good for you don't feel so good for you. Amen. Right? Mama said, go woods get back in those days, go get a switch. And I said, I know you don't think I'm going to get my own switch. You'll be out here for three hours. And, and, and she put that switch on. And she said, <laughs> this going to hurt you. This going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And I said, that's a matter of opinion. She said, it might hurt today, but it's going to save you tomorrow. So sometimes the word of God comes to us. The Bible says you shall know the truth. And the truth, I just put a little insert in there. I know I ain't supposed to do that. I put a little insert in there. And the truth shall make you mad. And then it'll make you free. So we're going to be all right. All right. So I want to give you five principles, really, of stewardship. Five principles. And, and by the way, if we're going to be successful in life, we're going to have to learn to live by principle. Can I say that again? If we're going to be successful in life, we're going to have to learn to live by principle. You will not be successful winging it every day. You will not be successful in life winging it every week, winging it every month. You will not be successful in life just going with the flow. And unfortunately, unfortunately, often, you know, church is the promoter of this kind of lifestyle. Just go with the flow. That all you need is the Holy Ghost, a tongue, and a dance, and all your problems is going to be all right. That God's going to make a way for you and open doors for you. That is really bad theology. It's almost schizophrenic. It's, it's, it's delusional to think that all I need to do is ha-ta-ta -ta and sha-ta-ta -ta and dance and give God a praise and, and lift my hand and everything in my life is going to be all right. That is delusional. And the Bible does not even condone that type of behavior. So, so the first thing we need to understand is that we're going to have to get some principles into us. What I mean principles, we're going to have to get some laws that govern the kingdom of God. The way God, that's what kingdom is. Kingdom is about a king. It's about a dominion. It's about government. Isaiah says, and our peace shall be upon his shoulders and government shall be upon his shoulders. That is to say that it is important for us to understand that if we're going to walk victoriously and powerfully and be an anointed in this kingdom, we're going to have to pick up the principles of God, the laws of God, because the laws of God are designed for your benefit. God's law is designed for your benefit. And I know I've been a child before too. I hate rules. I hated rules. I hated go do this and go do that. But the reality is that the rules were designed for my benefit. It was designed to keep me safe. It was designed to keep me healed. It was designed to keep my mind free. Rules are designed, principles of the word of God are designed for your benefit. They're designed to give you the life that God intended for you to have. So you can't hook a Messiah your way out of debt. You can't Rhonda Shonda Tasha out of debt. You're going to have to pick up some principles. Hello. All right. Let me give you five principles real quick. The first principle that I want to talk about, right? Martin Luther King was a man of principle, right? He had a principle of nonviolent protest. He lived by that principle. He died by that principle. And he changed the face of race in this country. If you're going to be successful in life, you're going to have to live by principle. You're going to have to adopt some principles in your life. Because winging it makes me nervous when you're winging. 
All right, the first principle, you ready? The first principle I want to give you is the principle of accounting. The principle of accounting. And accounting means, you ready for this? Could keep good records. It means to keep good records. Every once in a while, you know, you hear somebody say, I don't know where all my money go. Where in the world, after, after the end of the year, I can't even buy Christmas stuff. I don't know where my money go. Because some people think that all they need to do is make more money. Making more money is not the solution to your problem. Right? Because the Bible says if you're faith unfaithful over small stuff, you are going to be unfaithful over great stuff. In other words, if you can't handle where you are, you cannot handle where you're going. T.D. Jakes made a, a priest this ser a sermon called, uh, this, was, this was probably 10, 15 years ago. Are you ready to be, can you stand to be blessed? The reality is that most people can't stand to be blessed because they can't handle where they are. You cannot go where God wants you to go until you can handle where you are. He says, I will not put more on you than that which you are able to handle. That is, I am not going to give you a Lexus and you can't handle the Chevy. Hello. What I'm going to give, what, what do I look like? Blessing you with a 10-bedroom house and you don't keep the trailer clean. Never mind. Never mind. It's wrong with that. The principle of accounting <laughs> says that I keep good records. Why is it important to keep good records? Because you need to know where your money goes. All right, you give for me Proverbs chapter number 27. Proverbs chapter number 27 and verse 23. It declares, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading it. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23. I'm reading it. Go. Is it on screen? No. Proverbs chapter number 23. I'm sorry, 27 and verse 23. It says this. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. For riches, listen to this, are not forever. Nor does a crown endure all generations. Hang out with me. What does that mean? First of all, you got to remember that in the day in which this text was written, they didn't have a New York Stock Exchange. They had land. They had goats. <laughs> they, had, they had cattle, chickens. But even though the situation is different, the principle is the same. The principles are the same. I argue this all the time with people like RJ about how life is different for them in their day. And it is. The children today have to contend with stuff that we never even imagined that we would have to deal with. They live in a life that we never even could imagine. It's different. There's more access to stuff that we didn't have access to. There's more, you know, information that's available that we did not, we were not privy to. Back in the day, I used to have a whole library of books. Today, I got one iPad. Things are different. My library is in on my phone. Is on my life is different. Things are different. I agree, but principles remain the same. So in this case, it's it, they're talking about uh, sheep and goat, lamb, right? But, but the Bible says that you need to know. Didn't it say that? It says, it says, know the state of your flock. That is to say, you got to know what you have. You got to know what's in your account. You got to know where your money is going. You cannot free fall. That is to say that whatever's in the count is open game for me to spend. 
You need to know what you're worth. You need to know your net value. And unfortunately, most people are worth more dead than they are alive. Their insurance policy is worth more than what they are worth financially. And, and it's a, a shame. It is an atrocity that, that we focus so much on the emotional side of church and we don't put stuff in people's heads. And, and we make them codependent on us to give them a word every Sunday, to prophesy to them every Sunday, when in all actuality, you need to get in your bank account and find out where your money is going. What are you spending your money on? Where is it going? Because if you don't know where it's going, it's going to be gone. If you don't know what you got, if you don't know what you own, if you don't know what you're worth, if, if you haven't taken inventory of the stuff that you have, you need to know the state of your flock. You need to know the state of your money. You need to know the state of your 501, 401k. You need to know the state of the stocks that you have. That's what the Bible says. Know those estates. Know what you have. How much do I own? How much do I owe? How much do I owe on my mortgage? How much do I owe? How, who do I owe? See, I, I'm telling you, it makes people delusional. I think, I think some of this preacher talk makes people delusional. I'm going to just be 100 with you. To think that all I need to do is dance or run around the church and God is going to cancel all of my debt. For God, listen, I understand he will do that when you, you get your heart right toward him and move toward him. But the reality, if that is the state of play of your thinking, then, then you will never be responsible for what you do. God is just always going to fix it. God is just always going to take it away from me. God is always going to put your debt on me. Because I'm, I, I'm a little offended when you owe me and talking about God's getting ready to cancel your debt. What? I did not get that email. I didn't get that note. See, because, because God doesn't want you always on the borrowing side of the fence. It's time for you to get on the lending side of the fence. And I'm giving you the first principle. you got to find out what you have. What do you owe? What do you have? How much do you have? Where, where are you financially? Let's start right there because then we know what to pray for. Are y'all? Okay, I'm going to leave that there. Number two. And uh, you can dance on this, but I know you're not. I know the organ ain't going to go off. I know we're not going into a worship, but it's going to be all right. Number two is, listen, because if you're not going to live by principle, if you're not going to live by the word of God, and you have this crazy, the Bible says stupid, you call in, in Proverbs 21, this stupid idea that, that, that your stuff is just going to happen for you, and that you are not intentional about what you have, and you're not a good steward over you, what you have, that all you got to do is shout, dance, run, and all of this, it, it, you will be broke. You will be broke. Hello. All right. Number two. Did I say number two? Number two. Second principle, don't get on the organ. It's all right. Number two. It is, the first principle is the principle of what? Accounting. The second principle is the principle of budgeting. <laughs> that is to say, you have to plan carefully. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 and 20, that if you plan carefully, you will have plenty. There is a desirable treasure and the oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man will squander what he has. He will squander what he has. It is the principle of budget. Mm. So keep good records, right? We got that right. <laughs> Number two is the principle of budgeting. That simply means that I have to plan my spending. I have to plan my spending. In other words, come on, get the Holy Ghost now. I need to command my money where it's going to go. 
right? You know, feel like, you know, I need to command my money where it needs to go. Imagine that. A good place to live. I have to plan for it. Everybody wants to have enough, but everybody's not sure what enough is. You, you, you have to be able to define what is enough and how much is enough. To do that, you got to put together a budget. See, this is where good preachers go bad. I'm going to preach that one. I'm serious. Good preachers gone bad. It is because they never define what's enough. And if you don't never define what's enough, you will never have enough. You will always want more. You will always want bigger. You will always want more expensive. It doesn't make sense to me, hello, that you need three planes. But that's what lust is. You will never fulfill your lust. But a budget says this is, is enough for me. This is enough. Anything over that is something else. We'll get to it in a minute. But you need to determine what's enough. Hello. Because if what's enough for you is how much is in your bank account, you will always squander what you have. You will always spend what you have. And then we'll have to cremate you because you don't have enough insurance to bury you. <laughs> you need to determine what's enough for you. And that what's enough for you cannot be what's in your account. What money you have. Hello, because that's what that's how we live. If, if it's in my account, is is golden opportunity. Is <laughs> golden opportunity. I want to go. Well, how much money is in the account? Oh, we got enough. Let's go. You have to you, you have to plan for it. You have to plan for it, and I know that for most people, budget. Seems like a negative term, and, and I don't even actually like the word budget. Personally, I like to think of it as goals. Goals for how I'm going to spend my money. That's a goal. <laughs> of how I'm going to, sp I like to call it goals. And, and I want to give you three real quick types of goals, of, of goals for your money. That you have to have spending goals. This is what I'm going to spend my money on. This is how much I'm going to spend my money. This is how much I'm going to spend. You need to have spending goals. You also need to have saving goals. If you don't have saving goals, you're not going to have enough for tomorrow. Right? Because I deal with this in our African-American community. I deal with it all the time with people, and, and, and I, I mean, I, I don't know who messed them up. I'm saying to you, hey, bro, you're 50 years old, and you don't have a savings. You don't have no money. You don't have nothing. You got 10 to 12 good more years to get your stuff together, or you're going to be at Walmart talking about welcome to Walmart. Because you don't have enough to be able to stop working. I can't tell you how many preachers in their 70s and 80s still preaching, not because they want to, but because they have to. Why? Because they spent all their money. I know preachers who've been millionaires, millions of dollars who ran through their hands and they are living from paycheck to paycheck, Sunday to Sunday. What in the ham and cheese? We, we got to have saving goals. We got to have saving goals. I hope I'm helping you. And, and, and then you have to have giving goals. Here is what I'm going to do. That, that, that you, listen to me, I, I know no other preacher that I know will tell you this. You need to plan to give. It should not be out of any emotions. Because I have associate pastors 
who will emotionally empty your wallet and empty your pocketbook. They know the right isotone and dosatone to say. They know the right testimony to give. They know the right words to say. And before you know it, I did it. I left church broke. I'm giving all my money in church. And at this time, I was driving church van back in the day. I'm driving church van. I gave all my money. Preacher got all my money. He got money that I post dated. I get in the van and take the people back home. Uh, uh, Back then, minister, can you stop by McDonald's? We all give money. I give all my money. How y'all have money? Well, I don't go to Golden Corral. You, people know how to do it. I'm telling you that you should not give emotionally. You should plan to give. Because how can members have anything in life if they're always giving everything they have? They give it their, it's, it's interesting to me. The largest black church in America, the largest African American church in America, um, that over 80% of their members live in poverty. They got big buildings and fly big jets, drive Maybox and Porsches, and 80% of the members live below the poverty age. You know why? Somebody been preaching kingdom faith. I can't imagine that. I cannot imagine. Um, Minister Pharrell, <laughs> Minister Pharrell, who passed uh, a, a few months ago, he used to always tell me, he was my, my advocate, and he would always tell me, Pastor, I'm going to buy your church. I'm going to buy your church. God's going to bless me, and I'm going to bless you with a plane. I told him, brother, I'm going to take that plane, and I'm going to fly in at one time. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to fly one time. But as soon as I get back, I'm going to sell that plane and build a school. Because ministry has to be about changing people's lives. And the way to change people's lives is to change the way they think. Because ain't nothing in your life going to change until you change the way you think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We have to change up here. And when we change up here, we are able to then change what's out there. Jesus, what? Why, did we, why were we not able to cast the devil out? Because you couldn't cast the devil out of yourself. This kind goes only but by fasting and prayer that when you get your own self under subjection, you will be able to control everything that's on the outside of you. Hang on with me. Did I give you number two? I gave you number two. Yeah. I gave you number two. All right. Let's go. You got those three, three goals. I, I, need, to, I need to have goals for, for my uh, spending. I have to have goals for my savings. I have to have goals for my giving. Plan to give. Right? And that should be enough. That's why we don't have six services of uh, you know, have six offerings in a service. I've been, in, I've been in services where they have four offerings in one service. Four offerings in one service. I mean, offering takes as much time as praise and worship. Somebody said, we don't get out like that. We, we, we plan to give. You got it? You got, you got a plan to give. All right. Let's go. The, 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 we have the principle of accounting. You got that, right? We have the principle of spending. You got that, right? You know, you got, you got to plan your spending and stick to it. I wish I had time to give you some good, good tips on, on, on spending because if you're like me, um, the devil get at me when I'm hungry and at the grocery store. I'm telling you. I be buying zucchini pickles. I ain't know what that tastes like. But when you are emotionally out of control, you will spend out of control. All right. You, you got to plan it. Okay, so you got that. Uh, you, get, you got the one, two, three. Um, the next principle I want to give you is keep 
keep good records, principles of counting, plan my spending. We got the principle of bu budgeting, right? The next principle I want to give you is the principle of saving. The principle of saving. Because one, th one thing that I've discovered in my 21 years plus ministry, years of, of preaching, I think I'm nearly 20, I'm nearly 20, yeah, about 27 years old, is that people are familiar with the word tithe, but they don't have an idea of what that actually means. I don't even want to go there with you. I don't even want to go there with that. I want to talk about the principle of faith. Proverbs chapter 21 and 20. Proverbs chapter 21 and 20. Grab that real quick for me, Mike. I want to talk first about the principle of faith. I need to get that in my spirit. The principle of saving, right? The, the, the Bible, the, the, the Bible's, the Bible is not down on saving. I grew up in an in a age where, um, you know, it was stupid to save. And, and, and the message came from church people. Why? Because Jesus was on his way back. Soon to come. Any day. I, I literally grew up thinking that Jesus would probably come next week. Or he might come next month. I, I, literally, I promise you. You know, it, it was like, get up in the morning, Jesus, you coming today? Because they told you every Sunday, he's on his way back. And I'm trying to figure out when I got older, I wonder what he's coming for. Because it's been a long time. I mean, well, he must be he must be in Mexico riding a donkey. Why is it taking him ten years? What? How? What? Never mind. I don't believe that. So they taught us don't say it because Jesus is coming soon. Don't don't you know they misinterpret the scripture then. Don't say Jesus is soon to come because you might as well spend what you have because you know when he comes you ain't gonna have no we no no need for money. And they couldn't been more wrong. It could not have been more wrong. Some people say we're being presumptuous to say that you just trust God. I just want you to know. I just want you to trust God. Don't worry about saving because he's going to give you fresh manna every day. Because they didn't read that the manna dried up. They didn't read that the water out of the rock dried up. That, that don't worry about it. God is Jehovah Jireh, and he is going to provide for you. So don't worry about it. Spend what you have, and the Lord is going to take care of you. Hang out with me. I'm going to get there, I promise you. You should just trust God. Now, what if God... <laughs> What if God wants you to trust him in learning how to save? In fact, it is biblical and it is wise to save. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 20. Now, and this is the opposite of the way the Bible says two stupid people can do. It says, a wise man or a wise woman saves for the future. Save for the future. You hear that? They save for the future. A wise man saves for the future. Because money that comes easily disappears quickly. But money that is gathered little by little will grow. Saving is important in your life. Because circumstances and situations happen to all of us. And if we don't, because to me, this is just me, book of Bishop Shinsu, chapter 2, verse 9. It is embarrassing that when our family and loved ones die, we got to have GoFundMe pages. I'm sorry. Why? Because we don't know how to save nothing. We don't know how to save. We feel that we have to spend everything. 
Listen, let me give you a point. Being broke, paycheck to paycheck, is a symptom of a bigger problem in your life. It is a symptom. It is not, stop medicating symptoms and deal with the problem. When we deal with the problem, then we will be able to overcome the symptoms or we won't even have the symptoms. But being broke is a symptom of a bigger problem. Being from paycheck to paycheck is a symptom of a bigger problem. And the problem is, is that we don't operate from principle. We operate from how we feel or what social media tells us or these get-rich-quick schemes, these multi-level marketing schemes. All of this stuff that we think that money is just going to flow. It's, no, if, if you don't understand the principles that are in the word of God, then you will be victim to poverty. Got it? So, keep good records. You got that? The principle of accounting. Plan my spending. The principle of budgeting. Save for the future. The principle of saving. Then, number four is the keystone that ties all of this stuff together. It is the principle of tithing. The principle of tithing is about getting on God's side. It, it, it means it means return. 10% to God. 10% of all that I make go back to God. That principle, <laughs> that is the principle of tithing. And one of the things that I've discovered is that in ministry is that people don't even understand the word. They have no idea what it means. And I've heard it taught so badly before. I've, I've talked to people, um, you know, what... Tell me about tithing. And they don't understand. But let me try to explain to you exactly what tithing is about. One of the famous passages is in Malachi chapter number 3, verse 10. You don't have to go there. I already know. You know. Right? Now, the tithe starts before the law. Right? It started with Melchizedek. And it ended in the law of Moses. I mean, it continued into the law of Moses. But tithing is, is not a law. Tithing is a principle. It is a principle that we, if we live by, it, is going to bring the greatest result to your life. Let me, let me explain. It, it's widely known in Malachi chapter number three. When we pick up the story, it says, bring to my house, this is God talking, bring to my storehouse Right now, in the Old Testament, they had temples. They had a temple. In the New Testament, it's a church. So God is saying, give to my church a full tenth of what you've earned. Now, the word there in the Hebrew, it really is first tenth. See, the tithe is not just any tenth. It is not like the last tenth. It is the first tenth. And, and the IRS knows, <laughs> they picked up on this principle, and they say, listen, I don't trust you, I don't trust you to give me taxes out of your check. So I'm going to take it first. Before you get your check, he done, Uncle Sam done already hit it. <laughs> right? Not Uncle Sam. Uh, you know, the IRS has already hit it because they don't trust you to give it. They don't. They don't trust you to give what belongs to them. The first tenth simply, the, the principle explains this. God, I, I put you first in my life. That's the principle. Put God first. Don't put your children first. Don't put your dog first. Don't put your career first. Don't put your job first. Don't put Macy's first. Citibank, American Express, do not put them first. Don't put um, uh, uh, Xfinity first. Don't put your cable company first, your light bill first, your water bill first. Don't put anything first other than what God, what belongs to God. That's the principle. 
He says, I don't want what's left over. I want to be honored first. You got it? Now, I know that's a hit for a lot of people because they say, preacher, that's going to spend my money. Well, the money don't belong to the preacher. The money belongs to the church. Can I say that again? The money doesn't belong to the preacher. The money belongs to the church. And if the preacher taking your tithe, it's probably the reason why you're still broke. Get up, go. Get up, run. Because tithing doesn't belong to the preacher. He didn't say bring the store, bring ye all the tithes to the preacher. It didn't say that. It said bring it to the storehouse. Because it is how we honor God. It is how we honor the creator. It is how we honor the, the, the sustainer of life. It is how we honor who made us and who knows about us and who understands us. It is simply to say, God, I put you first. You got it? I put you first. You are most important. Can I tell you that? God is most important in your life. That's a powerful principle. And and God Almighty, because I can get $10 out of 20. And you will have access to everything that you, that is not, because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm not the, and it is the failings for everything that I have. It's giving. You are not going to beat me giving. I am, I'm going to be back at church Sunday. Hello. I don't care how much you're paying. I'm going to be back at church Sunday. I am not going to allow you to, to remove me from the thing that God has blessed me with. It is like Samson in his hair. Don't let no Deliah cut your favor from God. Your business is not worth it. Your wife ain't worth it. Your husband not worth it. Ain't nobody worth losing the favor of God. Watch this. He says, he says you have robbed me. And you are cursed with a curse. What is a curse? Because people get scared about that. Everybody think about witch, warlock, chicken with a head cut off, bird, you know, split down the middle. You think about woo, woo, you. <laughs> we think about all this, you know, Hollywood stuff. And think about this. What Malachi is saying is this. He says, he says, I'm going to let I, I know what it's like to try to preach without the anointing. I know. Let me tell you, you can make $200,000 a year and live from paycheck to paycheck when you do not have God's favor on your life. You hear me? It holes in your pocket. Right? You making all this incredible money and you money is already straight in. Whew. I'm sick of a blessing being an event. Blessed me with a car. He blessed me with a job. He blessed me with this. He blessed me. And those events happen, you know, throughout the year. Blessings were never designed to be events. Generational. As long as you kept the principles of God, it was to go to your children and your children's children. You are not going to speak in tongues and walk in the favor of God. Principle of contentment. Principle of contentment. You need to enjoy what you have. Because if you can't celebrate what you have, you will always be in the mindset that I got to get more. Ooh, can I tell you? And you can be content with that. Stop getting your panties in a bind trying to always get more and be thankful for what you have. Learn to be content in where you are. You got it? Whatever you think makes you, I've learned to that. And the, the blood suckers, the, the abusers, the 
manipulators that has set up shop in people's lives to drain of them of their finances, to drain them of what you've blessed them with. In the name of Jesus, I come against people, be free.